The 70th annual Berlin International Film Festival is set to kick off in two days on February the 20th, 2020. And there are a whole bunch of films that I think you should check out at the festival this year. So let's break them down. Berlin is the most attended public film festival in the world, and about 400 films screen there every year and play at venues all across the city. There are a ton of programs at the festival, including the main competition, Panorama, Foreign, Generation, Retrospective, a whole film market, and a lot more. If you are a film lover, if you are a cinephile, Berlin is a festival that you should try to go to at least once in your life. There is so much to see there. So obviously I can't go through 400 plus films one by one. We would be here for days and days on end. And that's just a live stream that I don't even want to attempt. So we are instead going to look at three of the programs, Panorama, Retrospective, and the main competition, and break down some of the films that I think you should be checking out if you happen to be attending. And if you're not, I think this video is still gonna be valuable because you'll be able to get a handle on what new films are gonna be coming out to the independent theater circuit this coming year. If, of course, those independent theaters still exist and are playing foreign language films. That's never a guarantee. Why am I picking these specific programs? Well, in Panorama, those films are selected because they are new works of independent and art house cinema that are meant to spark conversation, and that's what this channel is all about. So that one just felt like it was peanut butter and chocolate. It just works so well together with what I like to do. Next, we have the retrospective one, and I am just always happy to talk about new restorations. I love film history, and I love people who put it on the line, who put it all on the line to try to save films, because it's like Indiana Jones, except definitely not. And then we're talking about the main competition, because of course we need to know what films have the best chance at winning, and what films could potentially be setting the stage for the summer leading into, my god, I can't believe I'm talking about this already, award season in the fall. So first, let's take a look at the Panorama program. There are 25 films in the program this year, and honestly, this one's a little bit hard to talk about because we are typically dealing with newer filmmakers who do not have much renown to them. So I'm basically working off of who's in the film and what the films are about, but in any case, I feel like I've got six or seven picks here that will be right up your alley. And if they're not, maybe you should go down a different street and walk down a new alley. First, we're gonna start off with Mahag Mowgli by Bassam Tarek. This one stars Riz Ahmed as a Pakistani-born British rapper who gets an autoimmune disease when he goes home to visit his parents and as a consequence to that, might lose his big shot at stardom. I'm really into this idea because Riz Ahmed is a rapper in his own right. I saw him in Sounds of Metal back at TIFF last year and it was super good. And I'm just interested to see what Riz Ahmed can do in this role. Really looking forward to this one. The next film is The Assistant by Kitty Green. This one had a trailer come out for it a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago. And it's all about an assistant who works for a media mogul who throughout the course of a day comes to realize that she is in some ways enabling the abuse of other women in the media industry. Imagine that you go to your job every single day for a long time and then one day you have the realization that you actually work for Harvey Weinstein. So it's topical, plus that trailer I talked about is pretty interesting, worth checking out. I will leave a link for it in the description below. Next up, we have A Common Crime by Francisco Marquez. This one is all about a woman who becomes so afraid that she is unable to let in her housekeeper's son when he comes knocking on her door one night. And then the next day, the son is found dead in the river. According to the Berlin Film Festival website, the film is a ghostly shimmering narrative that depicts the injustices of Argentinian society. And I am super into this idea. I love films that point out social inequalities, Parasite being an excellent example. And yeah, I'm really hyped for this. I'm really looking forward to it. So put this one on my must watch list and maybe on yours too. Next up, we have Exile by Vassar Molina. And this is all about a pharmacologist originally from Bosnia who starts having an identity crisis when he starts being bullied or potentially not bullied at work. And in general, I'm always into films that deal with identity. In this specific case, it's dealing with an immigrant coming to a new country and trying to maintain their identity while trying to integrate into that society coupled with the fact that they're being bullied or potentially not bullied at work. And I think you're gonna have a very interesting psychological take on how immigration can affect a person. 
Keeping on the identity train, we have Minyan by Eric Steele. And this one's all about a 17-year-old Jewish boy who is starting to come to terms with his own homosexuality while growing up in a very conservative Jewish community in New York in the 1980s. This film is about shifting identity and how David must reconcile who he actually is with the community that he was raised by. And I think we're gonna get a lot of interpersonal conflicts in this film. And yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Next up, we have One of These Days by Bastian Gunther. And this one literally reads like Bastian saw a Mr. Beast video and said, you know what? That's actually really fucked up and cruel. I'm gonna make a movie about it. The plot essentially works like this. There is a competition in Texas where if you put your hand on it and you're the last person to take it off, then you win the truck. And Bastian is using this as a way to interrogate poverty and how it can be commodified and used for entertainment. Finally, from the panorama section, we have Welcome to Chechnya by David France. And this is a documentary film about activists going to Chechnya to try to help the LGBT community after the government tries to totally fuck with them. This is the only documentary I included in this particular section. I don't watch a lot of documentaries, as you guys know, but I feel like this one is going to be an important one because how the LGBTQ community was treated in Chechnya was a travesty, and being able to put an actual lens on it and show it to people who were outside of the country or outside of that region at the time is important and I hope a lot of people end up seeing it. So Panorama is over. That was about seven films from it. Now we're going to move on to the retrospective series. And when I was putting this video together, I didn't realize that the retrospective was actually just going to be focused essentially on one director, and that is King Vidor. For those of you who don't know, King Vidor was a huge director in Hollywood. He actually owns the Guinness Book of World Record for longest active film career, spanning from 1913 to 1980. And over that time span, he directed somewhere around 67 feature films, 35 of which are included in this retrospective. So if you are a King Vidor fan, get your ass to Germany, because they have a whole lot of stuff for you. Bit more information on King Vidor, he was actually nominated by the Academy Awards five times for his films, The Crowd, Hallelujah, the Champ, The Citadel, and War and Peace. So this retrospective covers more than half of his filmography and includes the aforementioned War and Peace, along with films like The Wedding Night, Stella Dallas, The Sky Pilot, Beyond the Forest, and so, so much more. And it's actually great because it covers a great deal of the total time that he was directing. So there are films here from the 1918-ish area, basically all the way, or almost all the way to the beginning of his career, and then going off to, I believe, his second to last film, which came out in 1967, I wanna say. So truly, truly, this is a retrospective, and one that I hope travels out into the world. I would really love for some of these films to make it to TIFF as part of some kind of program that they run, and if that happens, then you know it's gonna be going to the BFI and other big film institutions all throughout the world. Fingers crossed. It's time for us to leave the past in the past and get onto the entree of this video, the main competition. There are 18 films competing for the Golden Bear along with other various awards, and I've selected a few that I think you might be interested in. I know I am. So let's start off with The Woman Who Ran by Hong Sang Soo, because Korea is just so hot right now. Hong Sang Soo is considered a master of Korean cinema, and in this film, he is showing the interactions between a woman and three of her friends on the outskirts of Seoul. The Berlin Film Festival website includes such words as long take and minimalistic and dialogue heavy, and those are just all the things that I wanna hear when it comes to a film like this. So I am absolutely on board. I wanna check this out. I hope, I hope, I hope it comes to Toronto. Next we get to Siberia by Abel Ferreira, and Ferreira is known for directing neo-noir thrillers such as King of New York and Bad Lieutenant. This film though sounds a bit more introspective and a bit more experimental. It stars Willem Dafoe as a man on a journey who's in a cave, and while he's in the cave, he starts going on an internal journey and starts interacting with his dreams and talking to people who speak languages that he doesn't understand. And it just sounds like a whole mess of weirdness, but it's still Willem Dafoe in a cave. And so many of these things sound like they would be bad, but when it's all combined together, I just gotta see it. I have to see it. We've all seen 
The Lighthouse. At least we all should have seen The Lighthouse by now. We know that Willem Dafoe can act the hell out of anything. So to watch him slowly, possibly descend into madness in a film that sounds like it's going to be using a lot of dream logic, like, yeah, yeah, I want that. I want that real bad. Then on potentially the other side of things, we have First Cow by Kelly Reichardt. She has previously directed films such as River of Grass, Night Moves, and Meek's Cutoff, all of which are very good, and I think you should go see. The film focuses on two men in the American frontier in the late 19th century, I believe, and they bring a delicacy, or at least start to make a delicacy, known as oily cakes, and it starts selling really well, and they start making comfortable lives for themselves. However, the conflict arises from the fact that the raw materials that they use to make these oily cakes is stolen. Dun dun dun. Honestly, I know that that description doesn't really sell it, but it's Kelly Reichardt doing something in the Old West, and I would just see anything that she puts out. I highly recommend this to anyone who gets the chance, and if you are at Berlin and you do see this, please let me know how it is. Moving down the list, we have Berlin, Alexandra Platz by Burhan Kubani. And this is a modern retelling of the classic novel by Alfred Dublin. It tells the story of Francis, a man from West Africa who escapes into Europe looking for a better life, only to find out that people who are in Berlin who are stateless and don't really have a work permit are kind of fucked. And it's all about how he is able to deal with German society as it exists. Now, there are drug deals and sex addiction, but honestly, the reason I'm interested in this the most is because Rainier Werner Fassbinder, the famous German director, originally adapted this novel into a 14 part miniseries for German television. And I am just fascinated by the idea of having that retold in a modern context, but then also squeezing all of that down to about, I think, what is a three hour runtime. I'm Infinitely fascinated by how this movie could actually go, and I definitely want to see it. Then we have The Intruder by Natalie Mehta. This is a thriller featuring a dubbing artist slash choir singer who experiences a traumatic event while on holiday. Then a mysterious sound starts emanating from her vocal cords while she's trying to record, and it ends up almost ruining her career and driving her a little mad, a little paranoid. She starts to believe that the nightmares, the people in her nightmares that this traumatic event caused are starting to break through into her consciousness and are slowly starting to possess her. And I love this idea. The notion that a dubbing artist who must create so many different characters, having them all live up there in her mind, and this traumatic event shakes them loose and forces them into the forefront of her consciousness. This idea is incredible. I love it as a narrative concept and I am just so interested to see how it is visually executed. So this is another one that I would recommend everyone to go see. Maybe it's bad, but I'm sure at the very least it's going to be interesting and a fascinating film to watch. So those are my picks to go see at the Berlin Film Festival. Obviously, there are so many more films that are probably going to be great that I missed because I just don't know if they're going to be good or not. But I think everything I picked here is going to be pretty interesting, pretty worthwhile at the very least. If you are going to Berlin, please let me know what you're seeing. And if you're not going to Berlin, let me know what you thought about these picks and whether or not you're interested in seeing them when they eventually come out or if they eventually come out, as is always the case with international cinema in North America or I guess the world. Maybe they'll be on streaming services, who knows? Don't forget to like this video if you don't want your own sense of self to suddenly start being questioned. And as always, I would love it if you were to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell so you always know when I put out a new video. Thank you so much for watching and cheers.